and then I'm going to share my screen. Okay, yep, so if you'll put yourselves on mic, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. Okay, let's get started. So dynamics really is a very important thing as we were just discussing. So today we're going to have a brief intro to the project. We're going to look at dynamics. We're going to have a Q&A. And if we have time, we're going to have a quick exercise to look at how we can learn what uh, to sort of embed what we've learned. Here's a quotation. If people are succeeding, they look strong and good and competent. Your first impression of a thing sets up your subsequent beliefs. If the approach looks inept to you, you may assume everything else they do is inept. So Daniel Kahneman wrote a very good book called Thinking Fast and Slow, and he's really showing that that, that instant, that first impression sets so much about what happens after. And it also sets so much about what happens after in the conversations to the people that we already know. So firstly, we really have to acknowledge ourselves. We're probably living in the most intense times in history, okay? You know, it's kind of the cookie token that you get, may you live in interesting times. So we have to really recognize that we're still functioning and we're, a lot of us are still functioning and doing a lot. So really give yourself some credit for that. You know, there's a lot of people around the world suffering right now and are not able to really go, right, how can I do something, okay? We're having these Zoom calls to look into ways to reach people. There's a little typo there. Now, there's so much to the project in terms of its depth. We're going to look at one aspect today. And what it's really important to understand is take one aspect at a time. And each time you take one of those aspects and incorporate it, once you start to really get them all, that's when you're going to see some real change. So don't be sort of disbarred that there's still going to be challenges in your conversations when you know things, because it's really the learning the skill of how to apply it. And I know I've had conversations with many people in the group where they got something conceptually, but when they got it in their body, that's when it shifted, when they go, ah, oh, I really get it now. So today's presentation is an important hurdle to reaching people. And I think in terms of the hurdles, we've got sort of three bombs we mustn't set off, three hurdles and three things we wanna practice. This today is the most important hurdle. Okay, and there'll be a QA and a at the end of the presentation. So there really is a key point in terms of to reaching people, what I think is so essential, we need to, to just bring it up, is that what we are facing as those that are challenging the narrative is unfair. Okay, we are going to be asked via what works to pretty much go out of our way to shift our approach. Okay, the other person in the conversation is unlikely to do so. Yeah, both people in the conversation think they're right. We have to take the higher perspective. So in order to reach people, we'll go, okay, one of us is believing something or seeing something that's not true or not as true as we think it is. We've got to say, I think it's the other person and I'm going to take the higher perspective to find a way to get information into their mindset. That makes sense. We, if we've got bitterness and anger and all these things that you must listen to me, those things don't work, okay? So we really have to bear in mind that we're gonna take a high perspective. What will you, happen has been my experience that when the person finally does see it and you don't say, I told you so, they will thank you and often they will apologize. I've had so many conversations where people have been abusing me and then I've you know, successfully got my point across and then they apologize but we have to give them that space. So just quickly, what is the project about? It's for people wishing to challenge an idea, a belief or a whole narrative with someone who isn't, okay? Or even worse, they are resisting it even being challenged. So an example, we have Jane and we have Joe. And Jane cannot get through to Joe, and he's being very resistant. So the project is that Jane is acquiring the skills, the knowledge, and the right mindset to do so. The information in the project has been gathered from so many different experts and on so many different levels. And all we've done in the project is pull it all together into one place and try and explain it as simple as possible. Each person has more than enough resources to understand each element and get good at it. It just takes practice and an open mind. 
And of course, it's not related to just now. Reaching people and getting through to people and challenging their ideas is historically a challenging endeavor because science moves on one funeral at a time. This was the quote by Max Planck, and he was describing how any new scientist pretty much always hit a brick wall with the old scientists. So he was saying the new ideas really, and it's like a jovial quote, the new ideas gets embraced when the people resisting them are no longer there. Does that make sense? So Jane will have ideas and beliefs. Joe will have ideas and beliefs. And often if they're different and different conclusions, this is when the challenge begins. And this is why you'll find so many echo chambers, okay? Because the, when people are contrasting, and they have the different things, they tend to be in different groups. Okay. First impressions. It's actually more important than we realize. And the more I look into it, it becomes more important than I realized. Okay, so situations dictate mood and first impressions. So in fact, they ran this study, which seems a little bit of a strange study, but it was quite entertaining on some levels. So they, they had a young, good looking a gentleman walk through a mall and asked various girls for their phone number, okay? And what they found was that when, and they analyzed all the data after, when the lady had just walked past a shoe shop, they only said yes 13.5% of the time, okay? When they had just walked past a flower shop, they said yes 24% of the time, okay? And it's just very bizarre. And what they were studying here is literally the first impression. And, and, and what's going on is that the lady that's just walked past the flower store is in this sort of space where she's thinking about romance and open and she's in that space. A stranger approaching you is not a particularly pleasant thing I can imagine. So it just contrasted the difference. And obviously this is quite a sort of shallow study, but it's really just showing how the mood that we're in really dictates things. And of course the next one, was really kind of mind blowing um, for me, which was, you know, the first impressions are often outside of awareness. And if anyone's watched any of Darren Brown's work, you will see that he really uses this so often to get, you know, the, the sketches that he does. So they had an online furniture store. And what they did was they created two different home pages and they sent an equal amount of people to each of these different pages. Oh, and by the way, this, this is being recorded. So you, you can watch it over and over again. So don't worry about missing anything. So with the online furniture store, they had one page of the home page, which had fluffy clouds in the background. Okay. Not even conscious to the person. The people that went to that website, the majority of them bought comfortable furniture. Because in the back of our mind, we associate clouds with comfortable furniture. The other half was sent to a website that had pennies in the background. Most of these people bought economical furniture. Now this is kind of mind blowing is that what happens is that we tend to go in a, a sort of house and the, the front entrance of the house dictates how we think about that house. Another metaphor is like when we walk into a pathway, you know, we, the path entrance is dictating a lot of the time the origin, you know, the exit of the path. So really the first impression is absolutely essential. And, and if you haven't got the one that we need to get, then that's the thing to resolve before we progress. So how does this relate to our conversations? Okay, so if the person has categorized you as a conspiracy theorist, it doesn't matter what you say underneath. Okay, it really doesn't because people hate being called this for a start. So that's gonna trigger most people being called this into a slightly emotional state. And most people feel they're in opposition to the conspiracy theorists because they can't stand being called it. So those are people that will wanna follow the narrative. They don't want to be called that. Does that make sense? So they're in opposition to that. So in fact, what happens is that they just dismiss anything you say. The reason this occurs is that studies have shown that humans, we, there's a natural propensity to gathering groups. And what happens is that we then get defined. So can everyone just pop themselves on mute? A bit of a... Okay, so yeah, people have a, a tendency to 
to gathering groups that's very natural but then what happens is we often adopt the belief systems of the group or the behaviors of the group and what happens is we often get defined by them and then if you have two groups that are in opposition what will happen is that they will dismiss each person's each group's information that makes sense so once you've got the you know i'm following the science versus the conspiracy theorist they won't listen to each other in fact they will go out their way not to listen to each other and to give you a, you know, the example that I will, you know, and I, I try and bring as much humor to this subject as possible because it's, it's obviously quite a, an in-depth conversation. If you imagine the most staunch person that you know or can imagine who's against the narrative and they're standing there with a big board and it's got hoax, you know, the government's trying to kill you. And at the other end, you've got the lady that's worried about sitting indoors she has three masks on, she's got a mask on a dog, she's got gloves on. If these two people see each other, do you think they're gonna have a rational conversation? No, there's gonna be, they're not even gonna to listen to a word that each other says. And that's because they've already defined themselves into opposing groups and that's it, they're in opposition. So this is so key is that what we do is we don't step into this box. And those of us that are experiencing this, you know, there's many effective ways of doing so. So the key step is to reserve, reverse this assumption. If not, we get stuck in dynamic that prevents open debate. Okay, so that's the most important thing we need to do. So my dog's making a lot of noise. Sam. Okay, so that's the real key aspect is that if we don't successfully reverse this assumption, then really it doesn't matter what comes after. So then we ask the question, what is a dynamic? It's the often unspoken relationship between two or more people which often govern or dictate the conversation. So a lot of the time it's outside of awareness. This is the classic sort of child, you know, the parent-child uh, thing. A dynamic can prevent exchange of ideas and often does, has been our experience. So this dynamic is just how we orientate ourselves to the other person. What is the relationship? And it's defined from context to context and often from moment to moment. So here's an example of a dynamic. Okay, these two people are in opposition. And in doing so, it's a bit like a tennis match. They'll be on the opposite sides of the court. So one is their own label, is this person sees themselves as a critical thinker. This person sees themselves as a science follower. Okay, that's so all we've all heard these before. And then the person that's a science follower will be calling the other person a conspiracy theorist and the person that's the critical thinker will be calling the other person a ship. Okay, this is the typical orientation within what we're seeing in people challenging the narrative and people agreeing with the narrative. But the, the really important point here is that they see each other as on opposition, when in fact, the truth is, they're all members of the public. Okay, they're all on the same side, they all want the same thing, largely. So this is what's really that divide, and really that divide is the divide and conquer, is the thing that we're working with. So of course what will happen is that each of the ideas will just be dismissed once you're in opposition. Okay, so what effect do dynamics have? Okay, they set the path and the tone. So effectively, have you noticed how quick some people are to call you a conspiracy theorist and dismiss everything you say? That's a path that's well walked. And that path is well walked by the media. So they've literally given people a ready-made script. If we step into the role of the conspiracy theorist, we are going to be labeled with all those labels that they give them. And there's many other labels, you know, anti-this and anti-that, which will be, you know, even more emotive. So the caricature in our mind sets the scene and governs it from here okay so however we see them or they see us is really going to dictate how we behave and the dynamic dictates and are defined by the type of relating okay so how people are relating okay so there's actually four categories of dynamics and this is where it gets really interesting it's often how we earn value and I have to say that this is one of the most important 
things that I have come across that when I read about this, I realized in my own life how the dynamic was problematic. And I shifted that and the relationships in which I did so, my relationships improved significantly. There was a document that I was sent by a friend of Peter Aziz, and that's where the document is, if anyone wishes to read it. But it was very powerful. And then we took the concept and we, you know, we expanded it and related it in psychology. And effectively, he said there's four categories, and we're going to explain what these are. But there's cooperative, there's combative, there's competitive, and there's cooperative. And what you'll find is when you're talking to someone, and these are broad concepts, so these aren't exact, you know, art methods, but these will be very useful for us to see how people are relating. So if we first look at the supplicative, and it's kind of the parent-child relationship. So what happens for the first six years of a child's life is that they, you know, and, and often to certain degrees onwards, is that once they're born, they need the full support of the parent. They were completely the parent does everything and the child is just there being nurtured. And that's a natural relationship. But when you have this type of relationship in two adults, it's not really a healthy one. So what you have is it's really someone being governed and someone governing them to a degree. And it's really just doing as they're told. And the person that's being governed is often trying to win others' approvals and it's following requests. Okay, now obviously we will see a lot of people who are not challenging what they're being told. And that really is just a subjective state of mind. That's just, well, I'm just going to do as I'm told. I'm just going to follow the rules. They're the experts, all these things. So it's handing away of power. There'll be a lot of virtual signaling. You know, haven't I done well? You know, this will be kids getting the gold stars and whatever. It's trying to impress and, and get, you know, the value this way. It's really doing things to be accepted as told. And what happens is the orientation, if you come along and challenge that, you're then usually seen as the opposition. That makes sense. You're on the other side of the fence. And that's not strictly true because all the public are on the same side of the fence. Yeah? And that's the supplicative dynamic. We've then got the combative. Now, this is one that we will find ourselves in because a lot of people in the public are in a supplicative relationship with the authorities. They then become in a combative relationship with us when we try and challenge the ideas. So a combative, sorry, the pictures are out of order here, but that's okay. So combative is putting other people down to feel superior. So effectively, the picture on the left is when someone is really trying to belittle someone so it's attacking the other, it's belittling them, okay? Then you've got the orientation, which is opposition. So they see themselves as in opposition to you, you're on the other side of the fence. And this leads, funny enough, if you were wondering what that picture was, this leads to what we call objection tennis. Have you had the experience where you make a few comments, let's say that we make four comments or four statements, facts, and three of them are 100% solid and absolutely true. And the other one's got a little bit of wiggle room. Where do they zero in? Okay, they always zero in on the little wiggle room. Now that's the indication that the person you're talking to is in opposition to you, okay? Once they're not in opposition to you, you'll see valid objections. You won't see this nitpicking or this trying to disable your argument. Now what people will do very often when you're talking to them, is they will call you the names, conspiracy theorists, etc., because they want to belittle you. They're challenged and they want to bring you down. So they're going to be quite abusive. And it really comes from, as Steve Kerr said, if you can't challenge the idea, you challenge the person. So because your ideas are really not pleasant to them hearing them, they want to put you into that opposition and then they want to play objection tennis. Objection tennis is not fun because all you do is go back and forth dismissing each other's ideas okay so it's really it i think it's the worst of the dynamics and the ones that we're experiencing and it's the one that you'll see the most sort of abuse come from people uh, so then what we see is the orientation is effectively is you're trying to challenge something and then they're just being abusive but 
the orientation is you're on different sides of the fence. So then we've got the competitive, okay? The third of the four, the four dynamics. Now the competitive is, it's not that they put you down, but they just try and look better, yeah? So you'll make a statement and rather than call you nonsense, they just say, oh, but this is more important, okay? So it's really trying to win. So competitive is present in all sports and games, which is a valid place for it. So you're trying to win the argument. It's very problematic because if winning becomes more important than finding the truth, people will cut their nose off to spite their face. This is something you see often. You'll see the people that are a little bit more gentle and not so abusive will be in the competitive frame. So they'll be talking to you, but they'll be constantly trying to win you round to their way of seeing things, okay? Obviously, if we end up in that dynamic as well, it becomes very problematic because they won't listen to us because it will be a tug of war. It won't be as confrontational as combative, but it is still oppositional. And it may even come across as jovial, but it will still be resistance and they will still be in their mind dismissing anything that we say. Okay. So the orientation for competitive, again, is on the opposite side of the fence, which is why I'm better than you based on the, only on the fact that I'm not a douchebag. Okay, so this is how so many people are seeing. And of course, trying to bring humor to this as well, each side is gonna see themselves in the positive light and see the other side in not the positive light. And that's just a standard thing. <laughs> so this is the kind of picture that we see from the other side. They will, you know, they will take this higher moral ground that, you know, all the scientists are behind us. We have scientific consensus. Uh, whilst that is not true, it's also not the important aspect. So now we get onto the really important key one, which is the cooperative, okay? Now, this is so important and it will be challenging for us because we will wanna fight at times and we, we have had so much unjust abuse and we're watching you know crazy people do crazy things but if we're to reach the other members of the public that are literally on our same side but don't know it or can't see it then we have to get into this frame you earn value by increasing the value of those around you so effectively we're trying to reach someone we're trying to reach them to help them see what's going on to help them protect themselves to help them not lose their freedoms that is a cooperative frame. If we focus on that outcome, we're gonna start really getting into a cooperative frame. If we focus on you need to listen to me, they're gonna resist us like anything. That makes sense? That's the cooperative frame. It's really a state of mind. Complex problems require cooperation. So we have to find common ground. So, you know, if you're building something, you need to get a collection of people together to build it. If those people are combative to each other, it becomes very problematic. And of course, it's so important because until you establish this frame, people will not listen to you. So people listen to members of their own groups. So when you find the common ground, what happens at an unconscious level is that they start seeing that you're more similar than you are different. And then you're part of the same group. And then you automatically enter, enter a cooperative dynamic. And this is the ideal frame to discuss the narrative. Okay. And so many conversations I have had, I will start. This is my intention to make the other person realize my intention is of the same good nature as a lot of the other people's intention that are on the other side. Once they recognize this, once you can find that common ground, then other things flow so much smoother. It may be at times that you have to sort of come back to it and talk about a few facts or instances first, but it's my opinion that if you don't overcome this, it is unlikely for them to note any of the things that you have to say. People can object in cooperative frames, but they will do it cooperatively. And they tend to do it in a, in a way where they want to understand stuff. That makes sense. They really, at that point, they're like, oh, they get curious. 
it's about them knowing you're on their side. It's about them knowing, you know, not getting into the ring with them is another way that we put it. So effectively, we're all on the same team. And by all, I mean those of us not trying to screw the world over. Those people are not on the same side, but if we stop supporting them, they have no power. So it's really the key, effectively, if we look at a seesaw, there's people that we're not going to be able to reach because they're so in depth to their narrative, they're so good, but they're not the important ones. The ones sitting on the fence, if they become aware and they shift to, you know, challenging the narrative, the others will follow. Okay, there's a certain amount of people that just follow others. There's a certain amount of people in the middle and there's a certain amount of people that challenge. It's the ones in the middle that are the key. Okay, we already know pretty much what's going on and it's how we reach the people in the middle you can reach the people on the other end but they're just much harder so the cooperative effectively is the orientation is that the person questioning it and the person with their ideas and the person believing the narrative realize they're on the same side and they can start to ask questions because at the moment it's almost been outlawed that you can actually ask a question which seems very bizarre okay you need to put the spot tag that's in your backpack in the fridge okay i will just pop <laughs> i'll edit that out <laughs> okay so in summary and in conclusion it's always nice to lighten the mood there's uh, the the world looks after us. So four calories are dynamic in summary are this supplicative one, which is really doing as you're told, trying to win approval, just following the rules, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is really key because in another presentation, we go into the pyramid of control. How has things occurred so quickly and how has so much power moved so quickly? And that's the pyramid of control and the supplicative dynamic is what enables that to happen so it's effectively the authority principle people have an authority over to others so the stanley milgram experiments really give you an insight into that we then got the combative which is attacking the other belittling them we then got the competitive which is trying to win present in sports and games obviously a valid place for it but if you're if you're wanting to reach someone if you get into a dynamic of trying to win the debate, they're going to resist you. Okay. You know, when you're in this, it's a bit like this reactive thing that happens. If you're in a shoe shop and they're too pushy, you know, it just triggers this. The same thing with competitive. So, in summary, the cooperative really is what we have to find first of all. And if we don't get it, you're going to see objection tennis, all the other resistance. You're going to see all the other nonsense that we see. But when you get into cooperating, even if you don't manage to reach them, you're going to have a decent conversation and you're going to be able to sow some seeds. Because this is the thing. The top three connections, you often can't get any ideas to land. This bottom one, you get ideas to land, which become very uncomfortable. The person goes away and thinks about it. And then when they start getting exposed to two, three, four, five times of this, then they suddenly all, you know, they have this awareness. And you see it constantly. People go, oh, my God, I just realized. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back. That makes sense. So when we're in cooperative, we get so many more seeds to land that, in fact, you can get someone to shift much, much faster. So tips on dynamics and having good conversations is really the first thing you know, in this set in the scene is first honor their experience and then set the scene. And that set in the scene is getting into cooperative dynamics. Okay. Asking questions about asking questions. We go into this in more detail after, but if you don't do this first part honor experience and set the scene, then the body of the conversation really falls on deaf ears. Okay. They're just going to be resisting you. Even if you get to that point, even if they haven't told you to get lost before then, once you set the scene, it's really making the, the, the soil fertile and then the conversation can occur. And then you have a conclusion and then usually it's a very good one. Oh, that's very interesting. Let's speak another time. One point on this is when you do get the opening, know when the opening is closed. <laughs> this was a very interesting experience for me. I was over a park and I was talking to an old friend of mine and 
I was really checking in to see his response. And I'd said one or two, three, two things. And then I realized by the third or fourth thing, he was no longer listening. Okay. Everyone has so much space in their glass. Okay. Once that top has been reached, stop. <laughs> okay. Because nothing else is going in. So sometimes you'll get a little bit of a space and just landing one idea will have much more effect than throwing 12 ideas. That makes sense? Because when you think about the evidence to challenge the narrative, it's almost insane how much there is, isn't it? It's not like there's one little piece of smoking gun. It's like nothing makes any sense. But because people are so full up with, you know, with ideas that may not be true, there's no space for things. So be very aware of how much space there is. So the dynamics governs or affect the conversation. A successful dynamic leads to a sexual conversation nearly always. If the dynamic is competitive, sorry, combative or competitive, each person is highly unlikely to listen to the other. If you're in a negative dynamic, seek to rectify it before presenting any information, okay? Because if you don't, that information is really gonna bounce against the brick wall. Okay, so that really wraps up that subject in today's presentation. I'm now gonna open up for some questions and answers and bear in mind, there's a lot to process there. Currently, the Zoom presentations on the course are free, and we'd like to keep it that way. We may do nominal fees for certain workshops, but we want to get this information out to everyone as widely as possible. If you have benefited and would like to donate, then please visit this link at reachingpeople.website for, uh, forward slash donation. For videos and information, visit reachingpeople.website or info at reachingpeople.website. Thank you.